In my video for Love, Death, and Robots, I mentioned my desire to see more creativity displayed in Western animation. Particularly, I have a desire to see mature stories told through animation that fully embrace the possibilities of the medium. While in countries like Japan, it's easy to find movies and TV shows that fit that description in America, it's exceedingly rare. Love, Death, and Robots was a show that I liked, but for as many praises that I had for that show, I also had many criticisms of it that I didn't focus on in my video. For example, I really dislike how most of the shorts are uncreatively presented with realistic CGI, making the whole thing look like a video game cutscene. I also dislike the way it labels itself as adult just because it contains gratuitous sex and violence, meanwhile many of the shorts lack either a mature story or thematic depth. I did appreciate it when a short in the anthology didn't have any of these problems, but unfortunately, those were in the minority. Don't get me wrong, I still think Love, Death, and Robots is a step in the right direction, but it's still far from what I want to see, and a lot could still be improved upon. It's a show that unfortunately follows in the lineage of adult animation that doesn't fully embrace the true potential of its medium. As sad as that reality is, I have recently come across one animated show that I think represents what I want to see from American animation. The 1990s MTV series, Eon Flux. Now, I realize that most people's only experience with Eon Flux is the poorly received live action movie from 2005, but I ask that you don't let that movie inform your opinion of the show, because like recent live action adaptations of anime, it really isn't a proper reflection of its source material. Not that anyone would know that, because the Eon Flux series has faded into relative obscurity online, despite once being popular enough to warrant a Hollywood movie and a video game. No one talks about the animated show anymore, and I didn't even know there was an animated show of Eon Flux until pretty recently. This show is so buried by time at this point that I haven't been able to find footage of it through my usual methods, because no one is seeding the only good torrent for it. In order to get footage for this video, I've had to rip the files straight from the DVDs that I own. I think it's a travesty that this show doesn't have a cult fan base in the age of the internet where nerd culture is booming and anime is more popular than ever. So I thought I would use my small platform on YouTube to hopefully spread awareness about this show. So without further ado, this is Eon Flux. Eon Flux was originally a series of animated shorts created by Peter Chung in the early 1990s for MTV's Liquid Television. Chung had previously worked on Rugrats, which beyond being a surprising fun fact, is also important for how he approached Eon Flux. He designed all of the characters with long, athletic, agile bodies because he was frustrated with the limitations of the stubby proportions of the characters in Rugrats. He wanted to make something very unusual that experimented with visual storytelling. The result was the series of animated shorts that aired on MTV. The first of these shorts, which is often referred to as the pilot episode, is basically a masterpiece. The first thing you may notice about it is its strange and angular art style, which is unlike anything I've ever seen in Western animation outside of anthology films like Heavy Metal and The Animatrix, the latter of which coincidentally also features a short by Peter Chung. This show doesn't rely on pointless realism in its animation. It uses the medium of animation to present itself in a visually unique way that enhances the experience of the story. It's a visual style that can't be accurately recreated in live action. The pilot episode of Eon Flux is only 12 minutes long, but it accomplishes more in those 12 minutes than many feature films do in two hours, and it does so without any dialogue. The visual storytelling here is impeccable, as it clearly communicates to us everything we need to know in a matter of seconds. Eon Flux is our main character, who is seemingly on a mission to kill Trevor Goodchild, the ruler of an authoritarian state. The beginning of the episode is a montage of action spectacle, as she kills countless soldiers. Her rampage eventually leads to a quiet scene where a soldier stands among the dead bodies in a pool of blood and finds her wounded lover who has caught a disease that is spreading amongst their ranks. After she's shot by Eon, she takes off her mask revealing that she also has the disease. That's when the man succumbs to death, leaving his lover sobbing and alone. In just a few seconds, this short makes us care about the faceless soldiers that Eon is killing, and it establishes the hallucinogenic effects of a disease that will be explained later. It's a scene that makes us question the morality of our heroine, especially when later she discards the cure for the disease in order to use the canister as a makeshift hand grenade. 
This is a perfect introduction to the multifaceted characters within Eon Flux. Eon Flux herself is not an intrinsically good character. She has an admirable goal, but achieves it through morally questionable means, a pattern of behavior also reflected in her enemy, Trevor Goodchild. Though one is decidedly the protagonist and the other the antagonist, the line between who is good and bad is not so clear, and it is up to the viewer to decide if what the characters are doing is justified. The line between right and wrong is blurred even further by Eon and Trevor's complicated relationship. They're bitter rivals at odds with each other, but at the same time they're intensely attracted to each other, as they constantly tease each other without giving themselves the satisfaction of physical intimacy. This is also a good time to bring up that the show is tinged with sexual overtones and stylized by perversion and fetishes. It's apparent right off the bat in the BDSM style clothing of some of the characters, but then you also see foot fetishes and some strange tongue fetishes on display. And those aren't even the weirdest places that the TV show goes sexually. At the end of the pilot episode, Eon ascends into Trevor's tower, but she gets a nail lodged in her shoe. This makes the following scene where she waits for the moment to strike suspenseful, because you know as soon as she steps forward, the pain from the nail will make her miss her shot. Or worse. This scene also gives us a visual explanation for the disease and shows Trevor administering the cure to his lover. Then, just as Eon is about to strike, she steps on the nail and she falls to her death. This is the first of many deaths Eon would suffer, as at the end of every short, Eon would die, many times from her own clumsiness. Her repeated deaths are what made the short so engaging and surprising. You genuinely never knew if she was going to live or die, because obviously, the show had no qualms with killing her. And it could kill her at a moment's notice, creating surprising twists in the story. In the short titled War, the character is even killed off at the beginning, and the rest of the short follows various soldiers as it showcases the nature of war. The reason for repeatedly killing Eon was that Peter Chung didn't want his concept turned into a TV show, so he killed the main character after every short film. Of course, that didn't work, and we ended up getting 10 episodes of the TV show anyway, but hey, he tried. I can safely say that all of these shorts are my favorite adult animations that have come out of America. They present a strange, dystopian world with an atmosphere that just feels completely alien. The shorts constantly one-up themselves on how weird they are, and it makes you ask questions like, why does Eon have a hobo tied up inside of her cabinet? What the hell are these alien eggs she's getting? Why is it showing me the inside view of these two French kissing? Wait, what the fuck did he just do with her tooth? Beyond being weird, it presents a fully developed sci-fi world that is begging for more exploration, complex characters that slowly reveal themselves through the course of their actions, and it uses all of this to present moral dilemmas to the viewer. These shorts are undeniably weird, but that's what makes them creative. Every facet of them is unique and unlike anything I've ever seen. And again, I just have to express how fantastic the visual storytelling in these shorts are. It's able to tell you so much about the characters in the world without having any character utter more than a single word. Plop. Yes, that is in fact the only word said in all of these shorts. The Eon Flux shorts alone are a testament to the possibilities of animation, and what animation could be in America if we stopped confining it to kids' movies and sitcoms. Every short in this series is worthy of thorough discussion, but unfortunately, I do have to move on, because the legacy of Eon Flux doesn't end with the shorts. The shorts were apparently popular enough that MTV wanted Peter Chung to make an Eon Flux TV series, and despite his original intentions, I guess he agreed, because we did get a short-lived TV show with 10 episodes, five of which were directed by Chung himself, and the other five of which were directed by Rugrats director Howard E. Baker. Among people who actually know of the Eon Flux animations, the TV show is actually pretty divisive, because it introduces spoken dialogue. One of the main features that made the short so impressive was their hard reliance on visual storytelling without any dialogue. With the dialogue now being added, some fans decided that the TV show just wasn't as good. And while I generally disagree, it's not hard to see why some would be turned off by it, because honestly, a lot of the voice acting is really bad. Even the voice actors for Eon and Trevor aren't very good. Crab, we're going back into the cave tonight. Take me! <laughs> now? 
I have more important things to do. However, while the voice acting is a drawback, the TV show is still top-notch in every other department. It's the same weird, creative world we were introduced to in the shorts with writing that's just as good. And yes, there's still plenty of great visual storytelling to go along with it. Thankfully, Peter Chung didn't use the introduction of dialogue as an excuse to unload mountains of exposition onto the audience. And as a result, the TV show feels just as mysterious and weird as the shorts. In the special edition DVD set, the show's episodes are split up between the episodes directed by Peter Chung and the episodes directed by Howard Baker. And it's pretty easy to see why this is, because both directors have distinct approaches for how they tell stories within the world of Eon Flux. The episodes that Peter Chung directs are very focused on Trevor's totalitarian state, and they use it to examine moral and ethical questions, often on a large scale. In Chung's first episode, it examines the dilemma between honesty and privacy on a governmental level. Trevor enacts a new transparency policy that violates the privacy of citizens, but the trade-off is that it prevents crime. Meanwhile, Trevor's own promises of honesty and transparency reign hollow, as he lies to investigators concerning a politician that he secretly has kept away. Later on in the show, the episode The Purge examines morality as it relates to free will. It asks whether it is worth sacrificing free will in order to gain a moral society. By having Trevor implant people with an artificial conscience, the show questions what is moral. If you trample on a person's free will in order to stop them from committing an immoral act, is that prevention in and of itself an immoral act? Also, this episode must have influenced The Matrix, because you know that scene where Neo gets a robot bug implanted in him? Well, it's an Eon Flux 2, but it's much weirder. Much, much weirder. The episodes directed by Peter Chung are pretty layered with moral dilemmas and ethical questions, especially as it relates to a larger governing body. Meanwhile, the episodes directed by Howard Baker tend to be much more heady, as they deal with abstract issues relating to psychology, nature, and spirituality. The episode Chronophagia is a surreal nightmare, involving a virus that turns you insane, a monster baby, and possible supernatural forces. It's a trippy experience that will have you asking yourself, what the fuck did I just watch? The final episode of the show, End Sinister, which is also directed by Howard Baker, uses time travel and aliens to examine the nature of human evolution. It questions humanity's efforts to better itself and poses that our own attempts to save ourselves will ironically be what kills us. It depicts the evolutionary process of nature as something that should not be meddled with. This episode also has some fantastic directing. I especially love this scene that calls back to the visual style of noir films, with its harsh lighting accompanying a dark and confrontational scene. End Sinister might be my favorite episode of the TV show. The direction of the plot is pretty shocking, and it's the one that I find myself recalling the most. That being said, each of these 10 episodes is so dense with symbolic meaning that a thorough analysis video for each one would be warranted. And I can confirm that this is a show that benefits from repeat viewings. In fact, this is a show that was specifically made to be rewatched. Peter Chung knew the episodes would air multiple times and developed the show so the viewer could get more from the episodes when they watched the reruns. If there's anything I have against this show besides the voice acting, it's that the episodes are too short. With everything these episodes try to tackle, they easily could have been double their 21 minute runtime. We could have used more time to thoroughly explore the characters, the world they live in, and the moral and philosophical questions this show brings up. However, as it is, I can't really complain, because this is one of those cases where I have no clue how this was even greenlit. But I am so glad that it exists, and I'm sad that there isn't more of it. As I said earlier, I'm also confounded as to how a show like this doesn't have a bigger fanbase in today's internet. Eon Flux seems like something that the internet would devour, especially in a time where Love, Death, and Robots is one of the most popular Netflix shows of 2019. If you're a fan of adult animation anthologies like Love, Death, and Robots, or you're an anime fan, or an animation fan in general, I implore you to watch the Eon Flux animations, and please spread the word. Unfortunately, to my knowledge as of the recording of this video, there is no way to legally stream the show or the shorts. However, the DVD box set containing all of it is pretty cheap, and as someone who bought it without even watching the show first, I can say that it is worth every penny. Not just for the show itself, but also for the fantastic packaging that houses the discs. It's a very nice set that would look great in any collection. It's just a shame that it hasn't been ported to Blu-ray yet. Eon Flux is the kind of animated show that I want to see regularly made in the US. It's weird, creative, contains mature themes and stories on top of being violent and sexual, and it fully embraces the medium of animation. 
There is nothing else like Eon Flux. Hopefully watching this video has given you a reason to seek this show out and watch it, because if not, then I have utterly failed in my mission. I would hate for this fantastic series to fade into complete obscurity just because of a bad live-action movie. Sure, the live-action movie may be the only version of Eon Flux that general audiences are familiar with, and it also may be the only version that is widely available to the general public, however, that is no reason for this show to be forgotten. Other series without legal ways to stream them have successfully maintained large cult fan bases over the years, and there's no reason why Eon Flux shouldn't be able to do the same. Hopefully, if the show regains popularity, Netflix or Amazon will host it on their streaming service so more people will have access to it. Until then, I hope this video can make an impact, no matter how small, and help bring one of my favorite animated shows ever back into cultural relevance. Thanks to Eon Flux, I have something that I can point to when I want to demonstrate to somebody what animation in the US could be like if we just set it free. I'm Randall the Vandal, and thank you for watching.